Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Market Watch Mondays. I am your captain. I am your friend. I am your guide. I am your tour capitan in this dynasty offseason quest where you're striving to build, you know, that that roster that can help you contend and crush for two, three, four or five years, whatever it is, whatever your dream is. I am here to help you make it a reality. I've said this so many times before, but this is my favorite part of the season. It's the fantasy football offseason, but still the primetime NFL in season with the playoffs going on. But most importantly, it is peak research season for Dynasty. So I'm going to be here helping you guide you guys through that part of the year. Um, just taking you through my thoughts, taking you through my process. You know what this, this show is about. You know, it's about teaching you guys the strategy and the thought process behind how I approach the game. Not so much about player analysis, although we'll have many of those as well. Uh, as we go throughout the season but most importantly man it goes back to that saying like you know you give a man a fish you feed him for a day you teach a man to fish you feed him for a lifetime and that's really my mantra for this channel that's really my mantra of when it comes to my content um, you know i feel like there's so many other talented content creators out there that are giving you player analysis uh, and all that stuff uh, but not so much giving you the uh, game theory and and the strategy approach so that's kind of my little uh, my little niche as they say uh, it's something I love to do and something I like to talk about. So we got a lot to cover today. Uh, but before we do, man, you'll know what time it is. Hit that intro. All right. Just finished watching the uh, Ravens and Titans game. I was really excited to see this game uh, because I thought these were two teams that kind of just like smashed against each other pretty well you know in terms of their run first philosophy uh both with a couple of who i think are very underrated quarterbacks both konami quarterbacks as you know that's that's like my target when it comes to fantasy uh but it was just and a lot of narratives to be crushed you know like you know lamar jackson can't win the big game lamar jackson can't pass lamar jackson can't come from behind this ravens team is a one hit wonder like they've got him figured out all that stuff like i just wanted to see how it plays out and, you know, like Derrick Henry can't be stopped in the playoffs. Like all these different types of narratives are floating around. A lot of good storylines, a lot of good story arcs. To Tennessee's credit, they're an extremely good team. They came out blazing, went up 10-0 real quick. Uh, A.J. Brown uh, catching a pretty beautiful catch. I mean, people can call it offensive P.I., I guess, you know, but it was a physical catch. It's a physical game. I liked it. I love to see it. Uh, it's a damn shame. I said <laughs> it's a damn shame that A.J. Brown is not an elite route runner, uh, which is one of the knocks on him, I think. But, you know people win in different ways in the NFL. And that, that's the important takeaway there is like, don't get honed in on route gods or, or, you know, big and fast or small and fast, whatever it is, don't get holding in on one thing. Just, just figure out how it is, how that player wins and figure out whether or not if they, if the way they win works in the NFL. And we saw in the first year, AJ Brown, the way he wins works in the NFL. He's a big physical receiver and he creates that like little bit of separation and he has a quarterback Ryan Tannehill, that is great, good enough, uh, great enough to fit it in there. And he wins at the catch point. He's physical. He's obviously a freaking terror to bring down. Uh, so his yards after catch ability is elite, um, you know, and that's all he wins. And he does that better than 99% of the other players in the NFL. And that's good enough for me. You know, him, him and DK Metcalf are both, you know, have very elite traits. And that's why both of them are in my top three dynasty wide receivers. And they'll be there for a long time because they're still hella, hella young. So, yeah, I, I was really happy to see that. I'm really happy for Lamar. As you guys know, I'm a big Lamar Jackson fan, big stan. Uh, you know, I went heavy, heavy in him in Dynasty the year, uh, the offseason before he became MVP. And I think, you know, I didn't buy any of the year after that because it's really expensive. But I think now his price has gone back to a point where I feel like he is a good, decent, by low candidate. Although after today, it's kind of tough. I mean, it's just so impossible to freaking defend this guy. Like, you know, for all his all his warts and, and uh, his weaknesses as a passer, which I think he's developed in and will continue to develop in, just having to account for him on the ground game is just a fucking nightmare. Like, he's so fast on the edge. He races angles like no tomorrow. And he's also physical inside. Like, there's a couple runs that he had for, like, chunk yarders, like 10, 15 yards, where it was like, I thought he was going to get stopped, right? Basically, at the line of scrimmage, somehow he, like, squeezes his way in, dodges two guys, and just bursts through a hole and gets, like, 15 yards. And it's... It's incredible to watch. I'm super happy for him winning his first playoff game. Congrats to the young gun there, uh, former MVP, getting that playoff W, huge, getting that monkey off his back, getting all those haters off his back. They said he can't win. They said he couldn't win from behind. You know, I saw a stat today where, you know, Baltimore had like only uh, fallen behind by double digits like 
four times uh, since uh, since Lamar has taken over. And in those four times, they've gone 0 and 4. And this time they went behind 10 nothing, and Lamar came back with that incredible, incredible like 50 yard run, uh, just making people and making elite athletes, uh, the upper echelon of the elite athletes in in the US of A and nay, maybe even the world look like playground toddlers, man. It's just a beautiful sight to watch. Absolutely love Lamar. Super happy for him. Glad he got it done. And then, you know, I want to get into a couple of topics this week. Uh, one, which I talked about, I would bring up this week uh, on last week's episode, but uh, a couple other things as well. I think, you know, first off, what I want to talk about is like playoffs, right? And, and I put a tweet out earlier this week and I said, it's always, it's always been weird to me that when we talk about rankings and player production and stats, we completely, as fantasy gamers, completely disregard the real NFL playoffs. When to me, that's like, that's where a lot of the valuable information comes from, right? Because that's when the game is on the line. Yeah, one game for your survival. Who are they trusting? What players are they putting in? What types of usage are they getting? I, I pay attention a lot to the playoffs. Uh, and even though those stats don't show up in your 16-game paces, I think it's more informative. I'd say, like, arguably, like, you could, at a bare minimum, the, the, the real NFL playoff games should be accounted for equally as any regular season game is accounted for when it comes to fantasy. But I think like it should be accounted for even more so because I mean, some the, the, like I said, this is how teams, this is when teams are showing you all their cards. When all their cards are on the table, these are the guys they're going to, right? These are the studs they're going to. Uh, these are the people they don't trust. These are people they trust. I think it's, it's as valuable, if not more valuable. And it's hard to make it more valuable because like it's a lot of manual work. So at a bare minimum, like I said, I talked about normalizing points per game in terms of rankings. When I talk about like rankings and finishes and leaderboards, I'm usually always talking about in terms of points per game. Uh, because like that kind of accounts for the health and that accounts for the week to week uh, contribution to your team, right? Like, you know, put, put another way, like if someone is a wide receiver, if someone is like a wide receiver too, right. And they got there most, a lot of the back end wide receiver twos, right. And all the wide receiver threes, you get there just by playing a full 16 game season, but that doesn't really contribute to a weekly win your weekly win total. You need guys that actually contribute on a points per game basis, right? Devon, that's why Devonte Adams is such a big, massive uh, differentiator. Someone like a Tyree kill, like a Stefan Diggs. These guys are getting you those high points per game, even though they miss a couple games. Like I, I really don't care because you, it's not like you're starting a zero. It's not like a, the only one that hurts you like that is Deontay Johnson. Cause he's healthy. He goes in the game, plays a snap and then fucking leaves, right? That kills you. But if someone is not healthy to start the game, then it doesn't really matter because you plug in someone else and a lot of these wide receiver replacement value. That's why I always think about it in a points per game basis. When it comes to playoff, I really think we should be normalizing rankings on a points per game basis, including the playoffs. Because those games matter. Those games, that production matters. Just because it doesn't matter for fantasy doesn't mean it doesn't matter for real life. I mean, if anything, that those games matter way more to the teams and way more to the players themselves. You know, it's not like Devonta Adams is saying, hey, it's fantasy football playoff championships or semifinals weekend week 16. Like, let me put my game face on. No. What they're thinking about is, hey, it's playoff. This is this is where I'm putting out the best show for me and for uh, for my team so I can get the win. Because I promise you, fantasy players, uh, I mean, sorry, real life players care much less about fantasy than than, you know, you and I do. So that's that's like my little two cents on that, that little spiel. But I absolutely think that you guys should start accounting for that. And if you don't want to crunch the numbers, I know it's like a lot of work uh, to kind of get that manual data entry in. If you don't do that, but like you should absolutely still pay attention. Right. And the other thing I said was, look, this is the start. uh, The first part of the dynasty off season where you're going to see huge value spikes. And it's going to be a dichotomy of two things. Right. There's going to be there's going to be some players that just stay static. And those players will stay static because their teams aren't in the playoffs. Think about like a James Robinson, right? Like a CeeDee Lamb, um, like an Amari Cooper, guys that are just on bad teams, like Deshaun Watson's of the world, right? Uh, these guys are studs and their value is not going to move uh, in an absolute term. But their value will move relatively because there are other players that are in playoffs that will see value spikes, right? Guys like, uh, you know, today like lamar jackson guys like a marquise brown who i'm actually getting pretty high on recently um and looking to acquire some of like you're, you're gonna need to basically weigh the 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 pluses and minuses of players that are playing in the playoffs and if there's players that you didn't necessarily like in the playoffs uh that are in the playoffs or are going off for big games right you could look to flip them for one of the more static players and i think a good example of this was Michael Pittman. Michael Pittman had a great game, great game in the playoffs, came out, showed up, 
And does that mean he'll be the future guy going forward? Like maybe, I don't know. I mean, like I said, playoff games do matter and they did go to him when the, when the timing was right. Uh, I think, you know, but I would, I would much rather bet on a player that I had already liked and also seen positive signs from in the off se- in the, in the regular season, someone like a LaVisca Chanel, right? And I don't know if you can flip Pittman for Chanel right away because LaVisca Chanel is loved by the Dice community as well. And he did have a pretty good stretch, but if you, but before today, there was no conversation to be had about LaVisca Chanel for Michael Pittman, right? But now after this week, after Pittman went out and put up five for not five catches for 90 yards in the playoffs in his first ever playoff game and looked pretty damn good doing it, if I do say so myself, I think you can have the discussion, even if they add a couple. Maybe it's like Michael Pittman plus a 2021 20, third for LaVisca Chanel, right? Michael Pittman plus another add-on piece for LaVisca Chanel. I really, really love that type of transaction where I'm always, I have like a list of guys that I like, you know, coming into the playoffs who won't, won't change value, right? Guys like T Higgins, CD lamb, et cetera. And then I have a list of guys that are in the playoffs. I really like that. Make, try to make moves before they explode. You know, Cam Akers, one of them. If you looked at my top three buys episode, I said it was T Higgins, uh, DJ Chark and Cam Akers, right? Cam Akers is only one of those is the only player in that group that made, who had a team that made the playoffs. I was trying to acquire Cam Akers. It didn't really work because he had a really strong end of the season as well, and it definitely won't work anymore now, given the monster performance he put up yesterday. I mean, he's been a fantastic player. I'm still going to try and acquire him. Like, he's a player I'm willing to buy high on. And I had some, you know, people on Twitter, like a lot of, like, Daryl Henderson truthers really stuck in that take lock yesterday, I think I had some discussions with. Um, so there'll still be people out there. So there will still be doubters out there that try and create excuses for why Cam Akers is not good. He is a young 22-year-old rookie stud running back, was a stud in college, was a stud in high school, one of those serial winners that I'm always talking about. Buy a Cam Akers, man. If you can get him for anything less than a dynasty running back one, a top 10, top 12 running running back, I think that is a steal. Even at those prices, I'm still buying. Uh, he's one of those guys where I'm comfortable buying high on. It was a talent I believed in college, so I'd love to see him translate. And I, I put out this tweet yesterday as well. But if you compare the Miles Sanders to Cam Akers end of season, uh, 2019 Miles Sanders to 2020 Cam Akers. Cam Akers has been way more impressive from a yards for runs yards from scrimmage perspective, uh, from like every perspective. Like if you just, it, it's been real. I think it's been like almost undersold what Cam Akers has been able to do uh, so far towards the end of the season. It's actually been, it's just been super, super impressive. Like we all knew that he was raw, right? Like, and I, I said from the beginning, it was going to take time. And I even, we even said many times, it's going to be like a Miles Sanders type, uh, arc a story arc in terms of not doing much in the beginning of the year and really ramping up towards the end of the year once he gets the game under his grasp but if you look at the stats alone 2019 miles sanders 20.8 opportunities that's carries plus targets 105 yards from scrimmage per game 5.04 yards per opportunity cam makers 2020 25.4 carries plus targets rest in peace to all of the cam makers not a workhorse back uh, that was a horrible take, but, uh, you know, now we see what it, what it, what it, look, what it looks like. Cam Akers, 122 yards from scrimmage versus 105 from Miles Sanders and 4.81 yards per opportunity. So Miles Sanders was a little bit more efficient, but that's what you get with because he was getting a lot, uh, more target and work in the receiving game, which I'm concerned about going forward. But Cam Akers on a workhorse volume as they lead back is still at, is still pretty damn efficient. And putting out the production. The only difference in these two is Cam Akers hasn't had that many touchdowns. And we know those are a little bit random. And he is going to get that work going on down the line. Darrell Henderson is not a goal line back. I mean, Malcolm Brown is only a goal line back in week one of the NFL. So, look, Cam Akers, someone you should definitely be absolutely buying high on. Continue to pound the drums for that. If there are doubters, just push them to the side and just buy high on him. Because if you remember what happened to Miles Sanders in 2019 – after the season finished, there was like some buzz, but like as you really got into draft season, once you get started hitting like April, May, Miles Sanders went from like third round ADP to first round ADP, right? And the, there's really nothing that changed in that period um, other than him fading, uh, them drafting another running back uh, in the draft. And given that the Rams just burned uh, two back to back picks in back-to-back years on Henderson and Cam Akers, I highly, highly doubt they're going to burn another pick on a running back. And also just given how Cam Akers has performed, it just doesn't make any sense. So having said that, I think that the market is not really, hasn't really adjusted for that. Like he has not seen that meteoric rise. Miles Sanders was a startup round, uh, first round startup pick when it came to August uh, this prior off season. Cam Akers, I think you still get him in like this in the second, third round, which to me is a value. So if you can go and acquire him, I would take Cam Akers over every running back in this class. So 
if you if you can get him for you know if you're on the pick if you're on the if you're on the clock and you know you have a Najee Harris or a Travis Etienne lover right absolutely try and just flip that for Cam Akers or even Cam Akers plus might be possible so look there's just very many avenues to acquire Cam Akers I think he's going to be an absolute stud for years to come uh, you just the only the only concern I guess is you know if you're worried about his durability but he was a workhorse in college and didn't really have that many injuries so. You know, he had a couple of fr- fr- fluke injuries here with his ribs and stuff like that. But overall, I mean, Cam Akers is an absolute stud. Came back from like a high ankle uh, high ankle injury this this week and just absolutely blew it up in the playoffs. So hopefully your league mates don't watch the playoffs or don't pay as much attention. Um, so you can kind of go out there and acquire them, put out some feelers, or just wait until draft time and get them. Because Cam Akers, buy high, buy, buy, buy. That's all I can say. Uh, like as NSYNC says, man, bye, bye, bye. So just make sure you get on that Cam Akers train. Do not fade them. Do not listen to Darrell Henderson take lock people. They are beyond saving at this point. You know, just got to go with your gut and just get good players. I mean, people always talk about, hey, you should buy him on a discount. Oh, he's too, he's too costly now. Like, dude, sometimes good players cost a lot for a good reason. And it's because they're good. And sometimes you get discounts on players for a reason too. It's because they stink. So don't always be looking to buy players on a discount. Uh, I'm always fine with paying up for a player because I know that they're going to rise going on in the future. And that's, that's how I look at things, right? I'm totally fine. If this is like the trajectory, if this, the trajectory of a player is from like here to here, right? I don't know if you guys can see that, but if you can, it's from here to here. I'm totally fine with buying in the middle to enjoy the rest of the ride up. Whereas I think most people can't get over that psychological barrier of, Hey, I've missed out on the first part of the gains. Let me not buy anymore. It's the same people that didn't, didn't, uh, didn't buy crypto because they were scared of you know where crypto is gone and look at where crypto is now so don't be that guy uh don't be scared don't be scared to take the jump don't be scared to pay up for a really really solid dynasty asset which is exactly what cam makers is okay i spent a little bit more time on cam makers than i thought i would uh, so this episode might run a little bit longer but let's move on to the next topic and the next topic i want to talk about is going back to uh you know the michael pittman channel it is just like paying attention to the playoffs and making trades based on this is like this is a trade window where you you need to stay active right i've talked about staying active this entire time you got to put out feelers out there you got to put out uh discussions just start those discussions with your league mates and start thinking about how to acquire some of these players right because you got to get the convo started so that even if it doesn't work out come draft time you would have already kind of like laid the groundwork uh, for what should come and you know you'll, you'll have a better understanding of your league mates what they want what they need um, if you start doing that stuff early and that's why I started doing it now but more importantly it's it's because this is another value window where you see like value changes like after this after the playoffs end right there really isn't too much value change right other than just like people on Twitter like echo chamber just pumping players up and then maybe you'll see some movements but there isn't really anything tangible all the way up until like until at least free agency and then until the draft right those are the the key events that actually drive value change uh, when it comes to dynasty so you got to take advantage of this window and you know for me I think you know I'm gonna give you a couple of players and I mentioned one of them already uh, but one that I am thinking about, going out and acquiring more of is Marquise Brown, Hollywood Brown. So he's someone that got like a lot of hype this off season, right? Because, you know, he was the only guy there, the only guy in town um, and, you know, great offense, obviously could be a target hog. He's highly efficient last year. was actually pretty impressive with the touches that they got. So everyone was really in on him. And then at first I wasn't in on him, but then eventually I kind of got flipped and he had a disappointing start to the first half of the season, right? He wasn't, he wasn't that great. He had a lot of boom bust games. And what we saw was like a limited offense from the Ravens. Uh, people kind of adjusted to Greg Roman's offense a little bit. Lamar uh, didn't, wasn't doing too hot as a passer, uh, but he also like, I mean, Hollywood just wasn't getting the volume, right? And he put out some complaints on Twitter about how they don't feed, uh, feed their main soldiers or whatever the heck he was saying. Uh, but down the stretch, I mean, he's been pretty impressive uh, in terms of he's been getting there mostly on TDs, but I think today, I mean, in, in like I said, when, the game was on the line. Like, who did they go to? And they they went to their best playmakers. And their best playmakers, Lamar Jackson and Hollywood Brown on offense, right? And Hollywood put up a pretty respectful number. But more importantly, when I was watching the game, it felt like, you know, the connection was there, right? Versus before, like, it was a bit more, I guess, frustrating for them. Um, but today, they looked, I mean, they looked good. They looked on point. Lamar threw a couple beautiful, beautiful drops. Uh, Marquise Brown went seven for 109, right? So had a great, great day and really kind of just established himself more so as that alpha uh, going forward. But I, I just, I really like to see momentum carried forward. So if we're looking at the back half of the season, 
like I like to see that players like finish strong uh, and then especially now going in the playoffs leading into next year. So, you know, the concern and the risk there obviously is that they bring in someone through free agency, you know, if they brought in Allen Robinson or if they brought in, um, you know, Juju Smith Schuster or something like that, like another, you know, more target magnet guy, maybe that's a problem because it's a very low volume passing offense. But I got the end of the day, like I want to bet on good players, right? I think Hollywood Brown is a good player. I thought the, my assessment of him off season, uh, later on was correct that he is good. And I think he's proven that he's good with the touches that he's gotten. He hasn't gotten as much volume as we'd like, but for me, like I'm just going to buy good players. That's what I'm going to do more often than not, especially at the wide receiver position. I want to buy talent, buying the talent and, you know, situation might change and maybe it burns me. Uh, but I also think that, you know, the situation can change the other way. Like maybe they, if their defense takes a hit down the line or whatever, they become more of like a pass heavy uh, offense. Right. So there's a lot of things that can happen. Lamar Jackson, I actually believe in developing as a passer going down the line as well. So there's a lot of reasons why I like Marquise Brown, but I think the most important of all is I think the community really soured on him, right? Like after the first half of the season, like people were like, man, this guy, like this guy's not very good. And, and, you know, everyone went on like a massive selling spree and it's like what he did, what he did towards the end of the season didn't really make up for that. Like his value right now is still probably nowhere close to where it was in the, in the prior off season. You probably have to pay like a first round pick for him right now. You can probably get him for a second, like a middling second and super flex. And I think at those odds, like I'm willing to, willing to roll the dice. I mean, he was a wide receiver three. I think the chance of hitting a wide receiver two top 24 season is pretty decent. And if he does that, his value is going to go up and I think he's going to recover. So I'm a big fan of Marquise Brown right now. Uh, and that's just, you know, from, the tail end of the season stretch and also going to the playoffs. I think he's a great target to kind of go after. And then, um, you know, the other, I guess, relevant players uh, in this game that just happened is someone like a, you know, uh, JK Dobbins, right? Like what do we, what do we do with them? I, I tweeted out today. I think he is someone that has like that massive upside that can have that like 1200, 1500 yards with like 12 to 15 TDs, like on any given season. Cause he's incredibly talented. The Ravens run a lot and they actually go to him a lot on the goal line. And Mark Ingram by by all accounts probably won't be here next year. Gus Edwards, will he be here? Maybe Gus Edwards probably eaten to his work volume, but I, I don't really foresee Jacob Dobbins really ever taking over like a 25 touch role, but on 15 touches a game, just given the player he is, given how efficient he is, given how they run, given how they run and having Lamar Jackson cheat code as your quarterback, opening up that space for you, just, like I said, just a perfect fit for his skill set. Perfect marriage between J.K. Dobbins and Lamar Jackson. That's why we loved him as a, uh, after he landed there at BDG. So what do you, what is it going to cost? Right. Um, I mean, he didn't have a fantastic game today. Right? He only got like nine carries for yeah nine carries, 40 yards and a TD. So, and he got one target for like minus six yards. So not a great game in the playoffs. So if people are really paying attention to this, uh, I think you can probably get him at like a dynasty running back one. It's like similar to Acres. I have Jacob Dobbins and Acres ranked very similarly. Um, I think I'm probably going to have Acres ahead of J.K. Dobbins, um, if I'm being honest, just given I've seen what the trend looks like for Acres. Like Acres is absolutely getting that opportunity. And at the end of the day, like opportunity is king, right? If you look at Cam Akers, Week 13, 78% of the carries, 69% of the total opportunities. Week 14, 94% of the carries, 75% of the total opportunities. Week 15, 18, 88% of the carries, 82% of the total opportunities. And those three weeks are the weeks that Darrell Henderson were healthy. So all the Darrell Henderson were injured people. Like, like I said, it doesn't make any sense because for three weeks in a row, they basically told you what they want. They want Cam makers in there and Darrell Henderson in those weeks was held to like under three touches a game. So uh, and then week 17, without Darrell Henderson, without Darrell Henderson, 88% of the carries, 86% of the opportunities. And then the playoffs yesterday, at the point I tweeted this, it was basically, it was you could call it like totally Cam Akers back. He had 90, 96% plus of the total carries and 96% plus the total opportunities. So uh, like when it comes to the decision between Cam Akers and J.K. Dobbins, I think that's what's the separator for me is Cam Akers is getting that workhorse volume and he's going to get that for sure. Whereas I'm not sure about it for Jacob Dobbins, but like I said, I have them back to back. I don't think I would give up one for the other and vice versa. They're in the same group, but I do think, you know, if I had to choose one, I would choose Cam Akers, but both guys, man, both guys, just everyone in this, in this running back class, to be honest, is, is super, super high end. And it's just been the, the, the 2020 class was hyped to be one of the best ever. And I think it's, it's living up to that hype uh, by all, by all measures on the wide receiver side, on the running back side. So it's just interesting um, to kind of look at that. So yeah, two running backs that are in the playoffs uh, will kind of continue to track how the value spikes go. You know, if Cam Akers goes out and balls out again, I'm not sure 
how attainable he'll be at that point. But I think as of right now, there's still enough doubters out there. There's still enough people that are having take lock where you can still acquire him. You have to pay much. You have to pay a lot. You have to buy high. But like I said, it's okay to buy high because Cam Akers down the line absolutely has that top five upside. Uh, maybe it's not next year. Maybe it's the year after, but that upside is within his potential range of outcomes. So, you know, just get in on that, right? All right, so that's Cam Akers, Jacob Dobbins. And then the other player I really did want to cover is uh, Clyde Edwards-Alaire, right? Clyde Edwards-Alaire, you know, even though his team is in the playoffs, he will, I don't think he will be playing in the playoffs because of injury. So very similar to that situation where, you know, his value is not going to go up, right? His value is not going to go up between now and whatever the next value event is in the free agency. Um, you know, depending on what happens in free agency, it could even go down if they sign someone else, they resign Levin Bell, et cetera, et cetera. But he's someone that started off really hot, right? Really hot. And then kind of disappointed a bit down the line. But overall, the season itself, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if it's like a major disappointment. I'm sure it is relative to cost, but I still think I saw a lot of what I liked in Cloud Valera. He was breaking tackles. He was a pretty efficient runner. We want to see him get more involved in the passing game and uh, get better on the goal line. But, you know, we know those opportunities will come. So he's someone where I think you can probably look to uh, buy low on, right? Because him and as well as DeAndre Swift, obviously out of the playoffs, those are two, another two studs where their value is not going to change while you see guys like Cam Akers and Dobbins continue to play and hopefully ball out. So, I mean, what am I paying for a Clyde Rosalera? I think a middling first, right? Uh, I, like I said, I value running backs a lot. So if you can get them for middling first, I think you got to pull the trigger uh, because he's got, he's still got a long way to go, man. I mean, you're stuck with a Patrick Mahomes led offense and it's going to score points. No matter, no matter what people think it's going to happen. Uh, so I'm a big fan of CH. Now, is he on the same level of Jonathan Taylor? Obviously not. Jonathan Taylor it has always been my rookie one oh one, uh, And he's, he's been like, I think a top five running back in dynasty for me the second that he got drafted by the Colts. Uh, but I do think there's value to be had there because like I said, I think people have overcorrected a lot on that one on that front and the hate has kind of swung too far in the other direction to the point where I do think cloud was a layer can be a value going forward in your dynasty drafts. Uh, so if you're on the clock there, similar to cam Akers, you can kind of like flip one of your earlier picks for someone like a cloud was a layer as well to kind of satisfy uh, the running back need. So those are the plays I want to talk about um, from my end. Uh, I talked about Michael Pittman potentially like cashing out on him. I don't think he's a bad player. I just prefer to kind of cash out on that upswing uh, to kind of take on someone who I'd like before the playoffs as well. Um, so I talked about Michael Pittman. Uh, we talked about all the running backs I wanted to cover. Um, so that, that's all I wanted to cover for the players then. And the last thing I want to talk about, which is what I talked about last week, is how to study your competition, right? And I'm not talking about competition in terms of like, you know, uh, Twitter or whatever. I'm talking about competition in your leagues. And I've said this before, but like fantasy, there's two aspects of fantasy. There's the macroeconomics. Oh, sorry. I'm going to turn my lights off. There's the macroeconomics of fantasy, which is, you know, the ADP trends, uh, all the trade calculators, the Twitter, the information, the experts, what everyone else thinks in terms of the market, right? That's the macroeconomic stuff. And, you know, that's an important part of it. That's a macroeconomic trend, trying to study how these some trends go. But then there's the microeconomics of it. And the microeconomics is your each individual league. Each individual league is its own separate economy, right? Now, that microeconomy might be influenced and correlated with the macroeconomics. But more, most importantly, you need to understand the microeconomics of your own league in order to be successful. What I mean by that, you know, you know, let's say consensus, right? Consensus might have DK Metcalf as the wide receiver one overall right now. But if no one in your league values him that way, then you're never going to be able to capitalize at that type of value. So it really doesn't matter what, what everyone else thinks in the macro world. What matters most is what people think in the economics, microeconomics world within your own leagues. So understanding that is a key competitive advantage. I think people don't really focus on that enough, right? People are always focus on like, you know, when you go into trade, like what do people say? It's like, oh, well, I don't want to do the trade because he's worth a, he's worth uh, two first right now. But to who? If he's not worth two first anyone in your league, then he's not really worth two first at all, is he? Right. So in understanding how your league makes value players and how they approach trading and their strategy is, is paramount to dynasty success. So to go along with that, you know, the way that you guys, the way that people study players and study talent eval, I think, you know, you should spend that much time, if not more, studying your league mates, the macro trends and the microeconomic trends within your leagues, right? So 
you know, you should dedicate some time and this is a perfect time to do it. You know, go back to each of your leagues and kind of look at all the trades that every league league member made. Like the way I do it is, is this, this is the most important when you're doing a startup, right? I, like I said, I keep notes on, on league mates. It doesn't mean I have notes on every single person because some people are not that active, not that important um, in terms of like trade activity. Uh, so I don't really keep track of those guys, but the active people you absolutely do need to keep a profile on because like dynasties are built through trading, right? Trading is an important aspect of the game. It arguably the most important aspect of the game, almost as important, if not more important than the draft itself. But you need to keep notes on these guys. And that's what I do. I keep a notebook and I do it league by league. And if I have players that go cross leagues, obviously I keep track of that as well. Um, but how it works is I have like a list of play people that I played with. I try and keep track of their like account names on sleeper or, or MFL, whatever, just so it's easy to track them uh, going forward. And then like, I have like which leagues they're in with me. And that's like kind of like a table. So like names down the side leagues across the top and then basically like a check mark for where they are. So that that's like a landing page view to tell me like, Hey, who am I playing against? Where are they against? And then I have notes on those people and the types of notes I track the topics I want to cover is one startup draft. This is where you can gather the most information from your league mates, right? So it's important to start then. It's it's really hard to go back and do it because like you're not in that mindset anymore and like a lot of things have changed. Um, so while you're in the startup, it's important to keep notes. And one of the things you want to look for is who's active, right? Because those are the guys that are going to help you and you want to build trade partnerships with. You don't want to like fleece them because like if you burn someone, the chances are they're not going to trade with you again. You want to try and make fair trades and don't be that guy that constantly gives out low ball offers. Cause I can tell you from my experience and from other people that I speak with, like when you deal with something like that, eventually you just stop responding and you don't want to kill trade partnerships down the line. So make sure you keep a notebook. And the first thing I track is how active are they in the draft? How are they trade? Are they one of the trading up? Are they trading down? Are they trading a lot? So that's one thing. If they're trading a lot, that's great. The next step you want to look at is what are they trading for? Are they the type to, consolidated assets are they the types like move up in drafts like, to, to get their guys right or are they the people that are more patient and kind of trade back and are willing to forego uh forego like their players to kind of get value i'm obviously of that la latter portion um, but i'm not scared to move up when i need to so it that is one thing that i've i've found is like really important because like those are the guys that you're going to deal with and the guys that trade up and the guys that do the opposite of what you do are the ones that are going to make the best trade partners for you so if I'm someone that likes to trade back and I see other people are trading up, I'm going to like extend all the branches and send offers when I'm on the clock to those types of folks because I know they're more incentivized to move up than other people, right? So that's versus like if, if I track someone and there's like three other guys that also just trade back, right? Then I know not to send them offers to move up when I'm on the clock. It's just like an efficiency thing. And like, you know what they, you kind of like start building that profile. And the first part of their profile is how active they are moving up and down in drafts, right? And then the second one, the second thing I do look at is like what types of like what types of players are they drafting? Like what strategies do they go after, right? Are, are these like zero RB drafters? Are they running back heavy drafters? Are they, do they value tight ends? They, are they like early quarterback? Are they mid quarterback, late quarterback? All that stuff matters because if you understand their strategy, then you know what assets they're going after. But conversely, you know what assets they're not going after. So if you understand where you are relative to them, in the draft order, you can have a better sense for when you know you need to move up. Like a good example of that is, let's say someone is really heavy in, in quarterbacks, right? And, and they value high-end quarterbacks. And you've seen that because they went quarterback early or you've seen that from prior leagues. They love to trade for quarterbacks and they love to secure stud quarterbacks. Then as you're going down the draft and understanding like where you are, let's say you're you know four or five slots behind them, right? And in your quarterback tiers, there's only two to three quarterbacks left and they're drafting ahead of you. You'll know in that position to try and move ahead of that player uh, in order to draft a quarterback that you need to kind of close off that tier. So those are those examples of like the moves that you can make to kind of like learn about after you learned about and built the profile of a trader, a, a dynasty player in your league, right? So those are two things. So trade activity, uh, how often they move up and down, and then the type of draft and the types of positions they value in the draft. Those are the things I track. So a couple of things that come out of the draft that you can know you immediately come to the draft, you compile that as you're going through the draft. You don't have to like wait till the draft is over. Those are the key pieces of information that you get from a startup draft, right? And then after that, uh, oh, another part of that is like 
are they rookie hoarders? Like, how do they value rookie drafts is, is one of the most important facets you need to understand. Like, if they're the type of person that just throws away rookie first-round picks and move up in a draft, you want to make sure you understand who those people are because those are the people you're going to want to target to try and acquire rookie picks down the line. Uh, and those are often the people that kind of, like, go all in on a year, and if it doesn't work out, like, their rookie picks are going to be extremely valuable. Those are the types of guys I target a lot in my drafts, you know, if they're willing to give up the rookie picks and the, the easiest time to acquire rookie picks, the cheapest time to acquire rookie picks is in a dynasty startup draft. Cause people at that time, everyone thinks their team is a contender. Everyone thinks their team can win, right? Not everyone thinks the way that I approach that draft where it's like, I'm very flexible and I'm totally willing to punt your one to kind of set myself up for two, three, four and beyond. Not everyone thinks like that. Most people want to win right away, especially if you're new to dynasty, you're probably gonna treat it more like we draft. So that's like a that's the probably the most important thing to keep track of is how they deal with their rookie picks. Are they a rookie pick hoarder or are they a rookie pick rookie pick punter? And if they are a rookie pick punter, those are the guys you want to target in your drafts to try and get their future rookie picks. All right, so that's everything coming out of the startup draft, right? And then the next piece, it could come from your startup draft or it could come from once your league is kind of in in it's like, you know, once you've started competing and, you know, you've seen some of these contenders, like you're in year one, after year one, after year two, you kind of develop some of these tendencies. But do they go after studs or do they go after like, or do they trade out of studs? So me, I'm someone that likes to trade out of studs. So once a wide receiver hits wide receiver one value, I'm looking to trade down for a lesser asset plus. That's how I approach the game. But there are other people that want to just bet on sure, on sure things, right? They want to bet and consolidate on assets and just build studs. You want to actually find who those guys are because those are the guys that provide you a market for when you hit on a stud. So, for example, the reason why I like trading down on wide receivers is because I think that next tier of wide receivers, that tier two, tier three, is where you have the biggest opportunity for growth and biggest opportunity for upside. That's where guys like DK Metcalf and AJ Brown lived before they became the AJ Browns and DK Metcalf. That's where guys like Calvin Ridley were. That's where guys like Chris Godwin were before he had broke out, had, had broken out. And that's where guys like DJ Moore were before he had broken out. That's the sweet spot for wide receivers, right? So if you can trade down into that and get assets on top, that's always, in my opinion, the best move. And the easiest way to build a dynasty is to trade down on wide receiver talent. So you want to find the guys that are who are consistently trading up for top tier talent versus trading down. Because guys who are trading down aren't going to deal with you. You're going to want to find the guys that love to consolidate up and see if they have the players that you want in that range. See if they have the T Higgins, right? The CD lambs, the, uh, the chase Claypool, the Brandon Ayukes, these young rookie stud wide wide receivers that performed at a top end level and uh, going next year and see where they're at. Right. See if they have the, uh, you know, the James Robinsons you want, whatever it is, whatever it is you want, see if those guys have it. But once you have this profile, You'll know, like once you open up the spreadsheet, right? And you have the profile of the players and you have that box checked and you're looking for a trade down. It's off season. You said, hey, I have Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins on my teams and, and Stephon Diggs, right? How do I trade down? Who do I target? Go find the profile of a guy that one, likes to trade away rookie picks and two, likes uh, likes to consolidate assets. And that's your market for in within your micro economy of your leagues of who to target. So that's why it's important to understand the profiles. That's why it's important to track this type of data. Uh, in order to get to where we need to go, which is to find the trade partners in order to sell your assets. So those are the key factors I look for. I mean, there's other like minutia and, and details as well. Like, you know, which are the guys that use trade calculators, right? That's something I track. You know, if someone comes to me and quotes me a trade calculator, I immediately mark that off my sheet and says, okay, this guy relies on trade calculators. Not only do I mark that off my sheet, I mark off what trade calculators they use. Do they use DLF? Do they use DTC? Do they use some other calculator? Because what happens is when I approach that person for a trade next time, I'm going to use that exact same resource to make sure that a trade that I made that I'm proposing is within the realm of accept acceptability for them. Make sure, and often I'll try and make sure that it's favoring them per that trade calculator. But in my mind, I believe that it's truly favoring me based on the assets I've given up. So another really important thing, and people laugh about trade calculators all the time. They say you shouldn't use it, blah, blah, blah. I think that's foolish. You take all the data you can. And I don't rely on trade calculators to make a decision on my end, but if I understand that my teammates use it or sorry, my league mates use it and they rely on it to make their decision, then why not use that information to construct a trade and, you know, which probably increases likelihood of a successful outcome, right? So 
don't laugh about don't laugh at trade calculators don't mock them just use them like information is power make sure you use them and the same thing with adps right you know if people come back to me and quote me like oh well i don't want to take that offer because this guy's adp is this and this guy's adp is that well i also marked that off what adp resources are they using are they using dlf are they using bdg adp like what are they using like i understand what types of resources your league mates are using and then last part which is a bit harder to gather but understand who they're following right for me if it's easy like a lot of my league mates follow me they're on twitter uh so i know that but like you can also figure out who else they're following they're following like ray gq are they following nick are they following noah are they following whoever because then when those guys tweet about the certain players you'll know you know when that value bump is coming you'll know who they'll be targeting right so these are the ancillary notes it's harder to gather for every single league member uh but i try and do it for the ones that i can so those are the key buckets I kind of go after, right? It's just startup in the startup. I try and gather what type of trading strategy they have. Are they a rookie hoarder? Are they, or are they a rookie punter? Uh, do they trade up? Do they trade down? Are they a volume trader? Do they trade a lot? Do they trade a little, right? That's all stuff you guys in the startup. What types of strategies are they using? Are they zero RB? Are they, are they, you know, robust RB? Are they like heavy QB? Like that helps me identify the needs later on down the line. Then you got to understand what tools they're using, right? Obviously, that helps you understand and construct trades for them down the line as well. So just just a lot of factors. And you can set up the spreadsheet however you want. It doesn't really matter. Honestly, for me, just a list of names with those buckets I mentioned across the top and some so a room for a checkbox or a notes or whatever is really all you need. And the key is like once you have this set up for your leagues, the key is to do it early because once you do the startup, that's the that's like the most informative part, as I said. Once you do it early, maintaining it becomes like much more easy. Cause like what I found is like most people don't really change their MO much throughout their dynasty careers, right? They kind of, they get better as players. Obviously they get more information and maybe they tweak stuff here and there, but like the MO is, is usually the same. And once they, if they change MO, if you start noticing stuff, then obviously you can update your notes uh, to kind of do that. But for the most part, man, at least in the first couple of years, like people's MO stay, stay relatively simple and it's relatively similar. And the reason simple is because like, you know, people are comfortable doing what they know. Right. And if you something's worked for you or in their view has worked for them in the past, the chance for them changing is not really high. So make sure you track that uh, throughout the course. And I really want to cover this one in detail. And I probably went over quite a bit um, in terms of the episode length. So apologies about that. But I think it's really important to cover this aspect of the game. No one really talks about it that much, but understanding your league mates is like so important to winning. Uh, like, you know, understanding players and trends like that is cool and all, but if you can't get trades done, you don't understand your league mates, don't understand the competition, you're just not going to win in Dynasty. So make sure you do that. It's a lot of work. You put in the work up front, though. You do absolutely get the rewards. Uh, you know, you guys have seen my results. I've posted it before. So, you know, that doesn't just, uh, you know, fall off a tree. It doesn't come easy. You got to put in the work and put in the grind and be willing to kind of do all the stuff that needs to be done to get there. And one of the things that needs to be done is you got to keep notes, man. Keep notes, take notes. This this shit is check, chess, not checkers, as uh, as we always say, as Ray always says as well on his channel. So make sure you're playing chess. Make sure you're taking notes. Make sure you're studying people and just put in that grind to, to kind of build that dynasty and win that championship. All right. If you liked, please subscribe. Hit the thumbs up. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, you know, shoot me some notes. Shoot me some tweets. DM me, whatever. You got questions. I try and respond when I can. Uh, but if you enjoyed, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Uh, it helps us more than you know. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Make sure you tune in again next week for another episode of Market Watch Mondays. Uh, not sure what I want to cover on the episode yet. I have a couple ideas. Uh, maybe I'll cover um, one of, break down another one of my positional ranks between uh, 2020 plus 2021 class. I think that'll be a good one. Uh, and then make sure you tune in for this week's weekly film. We'll be doing a uh, mock draft episode on that. So that'll be good. Uh, we'll give you some sense into the 2021 rookie class, an early peek uh, by Noah and myself. But, uh, you know, mock drafts, like I said, they're not that useful, but it's always fun to do. But more importantly, you know, we're probably going to use it as a chance to cover some of the players we like. So tune in for that. And uh, yeah, it's all we got, man. See y'all next time. Peace.